Whether you're a world-class athlete or a podcaster like me, we all understand the importance of mental and physical well-being and proper recovery for top-notch performance. That's why I'm excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring podcasts on the Blue Wire Network. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers powered by Energy Enhancement System, or EE System. If you haven't heard of the EE System yet, then you'll want to listen up. This technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, purification, and rejuvenation. Wherever you are across the globe, access to a center is easy and affordable. Interested in experiencing the EE System technology for yourself? Go to unifiedhealing.com slash bluewire to learn more and find a center near you. That's unified, U-N-I-F-Y-D, healing.com slash bluewire. No material or testimonials on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regimen, including EE system. Your favorite source for Chicago White Sox talk, delivering news, interviews, analysis, and more. This is the Sox Machine Podcast with your hosts, Jim Margulis, James Fegan, and Josh Nelson. Thanks, Rob, and welcome to the Sox Machine Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Nelson, and it's Thursday morning, June 27, 2024, as we bring you a new episode of the show. The Chicago White Sox and most of Major League Baseball have now passed a halfway point of the 2024 season. If the season were to end on June 26th, your postseason picture looks like the National League. The number one seed would be the Philadelphia Phillies. Number two seed, Los Angeles Dodgers. They would have the bye. Your opening round playoff games would be the Milwaukee Brewers as the third seed against the San Diego Padres as the sixth seed. And the number four seed and five seed, the Atlanta Braves against the St. Louis Cardinals, in which the Cardinals continue to shock me. In the American League, the best team right now are the Cleveland Guardians. They're on a 107-win pace. They have passed the Yankees, in which they would be the second seed. Your three-versus-six seed matchup would be the Seattle Mariners, who currently lead the American League West against the Boston Red Sox. And the four or five seed would be the Baltimore Orioles and the Minnesota Twins. There's lots of baseball to be played, and there is the upcoming trade deadline. Both could be bad news for White Sox fans as the ball club is currently on pace to finish 2024 with a 42-120 and 120 loss season. That's with the talent on hand. Can you imagine what happens when Eric Fetty, John Brabia, and Tommy Pham get dealt? Hell, add Garrett Crochet and or Luis Robert Jr. to the mix. There's 81 games left and I'm not sure if this team currently has 20 more wins in them which is why I'm taking a mini break away from covering the White Sox as I'll be shipping up to Boston this weekend, as the Dropkick Murphys would call it, for my annual dudes trip with my buddies. If you have Boston recommendations, let me know on Twitter at SoxMachine underscore Josh as I've never been to Boston before. And yes, I'll be making my first visit to Fenway over the weekend. While I'm away, I've recorded this episode with two of Sox Machine's best friends. While the Chicago White Sox have been awful, the Birmingham Barons are not, as the White Sox AA affiliate clinched their first postseason berth since 2013 by winning the Southern League first half. Barons president and general manager Jonathan Nelson will join me later in the show to chat about the Barons' successful first half while sharing stories about last week's Rickwood Classic and what the future holds for that event. But first, let's talk about how bad this White Sox team is currently, and what the near future holds. You can read his work on Fangraphs.com and view his very weird AI art on Twitter, at DZimborski. It's our best friend of the show, Dan Zimborski. Dan, welcome back to the Sox Machine Podcast. Hey, Josh, how's it going? Are you having some Taco Bell for lunch? (laughs) No, no, I'm actually heading to Boston uh, this weekend. So I'm trying to cut down the Taco Bell because I don't think eating Taco Bell before getting on a flight to Boston is a great idea. Yeah, you're 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 you. The seatbelt light goes goes off, and all of a sudden, oh, chalupas. <laughs> yeah, especially on a Southwest. Flight. I've got chalupa uh, bowel. <laughs> 
Well, speaking of Chalupa Bowel, uh, that's what it feels like watching this White Sox team in uh, 2024. At the halfway point, the White Sox are 21 and 60, which I have to chuckle because Jim Margulis on SoxMachine.com wrote his annual double up post. So taking the midseason point and doubling what the White Sox have already done this year and what it would look like if they keep this pace. We're looking at a 42 and 120 win team in 2024. Did you ever think, Dan, you would see a team this bad again, like the 2003 Detroit Tigers? It. You see, the thing is, to be this bad, you have to have a lot of things go the right way for horror. Uh, you, I, I think that most teams that at the major league level, probably if you if you say, okay, what's this team's ability per 162 games? I think it's really hard to get below 50, 55. Uh, so you you need to blend that with additional horror to make the true horror of of a of a tiger season come true. You need you, just like you need some luck to win 115 games. You need some of the negative kind of luck to only win 40 games or 42 or 45. Uh, but but that's the thing about the White Sox. They've been bad and unlucky. So it's worked out well if if you're if you want to see them be very bad. Well, what does Zips think? Does Zips think that the White Sox will lose 120 games this season? They do not. It's it's very boring. Uh, Zips thinks that they'll choke and and win more games than they have. That they are playing <laughs> reverse choke. Well, yeah, but you see, here's the thing: <laughs> if you're going to be awful at something, be really, really awful at it. See, pe- people remember the 1962 Mets. How many 47 and 115 win teams are remembered or 47, 115 win loss teams are remembered? Very few. But the Mets are remembered uh, in in a way that I think a a slightly less horrifying team would not be. So there is there is something to to that. Uh, If you're going to be bad, you know, be be the best bad that you can be. Uh, But Zips disappointingly has them finishing around 50 wins. Uh, so not only will they be bad, they'll be bad and forgotten in 10 years. Well, the question I have with, about that, and this was a very popular question among our Patreon supporters, which again, thank you to our Sox Machine Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash Sox Machine. I'm assuming Zips is making that projection, Dan, right now with the current roster because Zips doesn't know yeah. anybody's been traded yet. And we got this question from one of our Patreon supporters, Ron Bo, and he wrote to us, since the White Sox have many rookies playing on the team after the trade deadline, do we have any idea how Zips could predict what the White Sox will do in August and September? And that must be hard to configure Zips to do that. Like if Luis Robert and Garrett Crochet and Eric Fetty are traded before the deadline in July, I have to imagine that Zips is going to radically change in what it thinks the White Sox, what kind of record the White Sox will finish with. It's very tricky to do, especially before a season, because there's so much uncertainty. I've tried to work that into the model of the of the preseason to kind of, you know, write a generalized model for whether a team in the future will improve their team or unimprove their team. Uh, worse than I guess would be an actual word to use. Uh, but as we get towards the deadline and things are a little clearer, I'm more confident. And so when I do the depth charts, I'm already assuming relatively few plate appearances uh, for and innings pitched for, for the players who could theoretically be traded. Uh, like I only have crochet with like 25 more innings for the white Sox okay. uh, simply because I think there's a really, really good chance now. And there's really no way for a computer to make that evaluation for me, which I hate because I don't want to kind of meld zips and Zaborski into some kind of weird robot killer. Like, What's her face in Superman three who, <laughs> you know, after Richard Pryor made the evil smoking Superman and and uh, the guy from uh, the spy I show. I don't know this movie well. Oh, OK. Well, there was a, a lady who turned into kind of a androidy creature thing mm. and Superman had to fight her. Uh, someone will remember this and probably remember the details, including the actors names. Robert Jordan was that the actor? Uh, no, that wasn't Robert Jordan, or was it? No, I'm very confused. I'm just confusing myself at this point. <laughs> but so there is kind of a basis, and the thing is, um, 
it's probably not a huge number of wins when you're talking two months of a, of a, de of a decline. Yeah. You, crochet is very valuable to the White Sox and whoever replaces their innings will be, will be a lot less valuable, but we're not talking a ton of wins. It's not going to be like four wins that are going to disappear because no one's worth four wins in two months. That's going to be traded by the White Sox. So there's a good chance they will be a little worse if you just look at their preseason record, but hopefully my guesses for playing time are accurate. Let's talk trades because that's really the only eventful thing left in this White Sox season outside of the Major League Baseball draft, which will be again happening on Sunday, July 14th. James Vegan and I came up with our White Sox trade power rankings recently, Dan. And we obviously had Luis Robert Jr. and Garrett Crochet as the number one and number two trade assets for the White Sox. But we thought the probability of trading Robert was low at this moment. And with Garrett Crochet, we're 50-50 on the odds of him getting dealt before the end of, end of July. Do you think Chris Getz has to trade either or before July's deadline to get this team back to some type of contention mode within the next two years, let's say? Uh, well, I guess to be very negative, I have very little faith in the White Sox. So I kind of expect them to sort of do a fire sale, which means they won't get enough prospects to really restock things well, and they won't retain enough value to use that as the basis for the future. So under that kind of assumption, maybe I'm just being mean, but I mean, there's not a lot of reason to have a faith in this organization right now. I, I see them most likely trading Crochet and less likely to trade Robert, even though they really, really should. Because you look at where the, the organization is, and even competing in 2027, which is their second team option for Robert, looks really unlikely. Uh, now, the one question is if teams are going to lowball them because of the injury history, and that is legitimate. But I think at some point, if it's not this deadline, they're going to have to trade Robert if they're thinking about things realistically. And again... Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. not always sure they are. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Robert, again, I just think would be difficult for the White Sox, especially for Chris Getz, to trade before the end of July, but he's open to it. Crochet, I think, at some point next month, if he continues to pitch as well as he has, the National League contenders are going to be texting Chris Getz because they would love to have Crochet, whether in their starting rotation or out of their bullpen. I mean, the National League, Dan, either you're going to have to go through Bryce Harper or Kyle Schwarber or you have to go through Shohei Otani and Freddie Freeman. So having someone like Crochet, who will help you out in 2025 in the starting rotation, yeah. but at least in the upcoming postseason, he'll still be very valuable out of someone's bullpen, especially in those high leverage situations. Yeah, so. they, they have a lot of flexibility. You, you, you can use Crochet down the in the bullpen down the stretch to have him start in the playoffs. You can use him in the bullpen in the playoffs, and you can have him pass this season. And the thing is, there aren't that many teams that are just – horribly like dead in the water, completely out of the race at this point. Uh, like in, in the American league, there are only really three teams that are completely dead in the water. The white Sox, the angels and the A's in the national league. There really only are two teams that are completely dead in the water, the Rockies and the Marlins. And one of those teams, the Rockies doesn't ever seem to realize that they need to trade players to get a better future. <laughs> so this is kind of a, a good market for sellers. So, I think they'll get a really good offer for Crochet, probably more than he's worth. And when your opponent wants to make do that, you don't really want to, you know, turn them down. Uh, I think they'll get a good package for Crochet. I think they'll get a surprisingly good prospect for Eric uh, Fetty. I think they do have a few players who teams would want. Uh, I think even a couple of their random relievers who are struggling or at least interesting enough that a team that needs bullpen depth might throw a sort of prospect at or two at them. Uh, I think if the White Sox were serious, they could find takers for all, all these players with value. Now, I think they could even maybe get a player for Paul DeYoung, who's worked out very well for the team. Uh, he's been one of their, I guess, triumphant victories, relatively speaking, this year. Um, they they do have players to trade, um, but, you know, we'll see what they do. We'll see if, you know, Robbie, 
I, I don't I don't know what the team is doing. If they're going to, you know, for all I know, they could go and reacquire Robbie Grossman from the Rangers. They, <laughs> you know what? We miss him because. Well, they they cut Kevin Pilar for Robbie Grossman. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm still confused about why they cut Pilar, because at the time he wasn't having a bad season. I mean, relatively speaking, uh, he had an eighth. 85 OPS plus. That's not good. But for a guy who can play center, they they actually had worse problems than than Kevin Pillar at the time. Now, I'm not going to fault them for him with a 900 OPS since because only a crazy person would have predicted that. But it, <laughs> sometimes this organization's parties are just confusing. I was conf you, were, you remember I was confused at times when they were on the when they were rebuilding. I was confused at times when they were contending. And I'm still confused at times about how this organization is run. Well, you mentioned Eric Fetty. Who do you think needs Eric Fetty the most out of the contenders? I don't know about needs the most simply because I think any team that would want Fetty probably should want Crochet more. But I can see a team <clears throat> that wants to add pitching but just doesn't want to commit to, pros to the prospectage required to get Crochet might be going after it. Like if the Orioles were feeling a little conservative, I can see them uh, going for Fetty because they don't mind having these these fill in guys like when they had Kyle Gibson for a few years, when they were content to have Cole Irvin in the rotation, which has actually worked out surprisingly well compared to how it should. Uh, I could, I could see the Orioles being interested in them, but you know, a lot of teams need pitching or a lot of teams in contention right now. Yeah. There's one article. I think it was Jeff Pass at ESPN mentioned Cleveland. And I thought that was uh, an interesting possible target as the guardians right now have the best record in the American league as we record this, which is still mind blowing. Uh, we got a couple of additional questions from our Patreon supporters, one from trooper Galactus. And he wrote Dan in light of the white Sox upcoming series against Colorado, who has more guys with a career driving off a cliff, the white Sox or Ca Casa Bonita. <laughs> hey, I, 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 I'm, I'm ex I was excited that day that, that, that the guys bought Casa Bonita and and have refurbished it. Apparently, I did get yeah. to go. I think it was it was 2017 or 2018. It was pre-COVID. I did get to go to the Casa Bonita uh, because a friend of mine lived uh, in in Pueblo at the time, and so we hung out in Denver a lot. And we got to go to Casa Bonita, and they did have the cliff divers. The food was pretty bad. It was like an 80s. Uh, taco shell commercial. It was like the old '80s tacos. <laughs> you know when I say the '80s tacos, you know you have the 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 very hard yellow shell. Yeah. The the like the ground beef with the taco seasoning packet that you buy, the little McCormick taco seasoning and like chopped tomatoes and like 15 pounds of cheese. I, think, I don't have any problems with cheese, but it was it, the food was not good. Uh, but it was very kitschy, and I did enjoy the experience. Uh. But I actually got off topic here, uh, which is the Rockies. <laughs> the Rockies are a team that tends to flail similarly to the White Sox. I do think that in the end they'll make trades, but I really don't know about this team. Yeah, I I can't get a feel for the Rockies either. It sounds like they got buyers or more Sir Chris Bryant, or maybe they should have buyers or more Sir Chris Bryant. Yeah, they they should. It's hard to tell because. Ownership has driven a lot of their worst moves. Uh, I'm right. pretty confident. No one I can quote on it, even though I, I do talk to front offices, including the Rockies. I really got the impression that Bryant was like very, very heavily pushed by ownership and ownership wanted him. Uh, I even heard the words uh, carnival that he brings butts into the seats, which really no player does unless they're a special event player like Fernando Valenzuela in the early 80s, uh, McGuire and and Sosa during the home run chase, Ripken during the 2130 run, uh, Otani now. Uh, very, very yeah. few players really do that. Generally speaking, wins are the way you push fans or the, the perception of wins. Uh, and 
it didn't really work out for the Rockies at all. And it's worked out even worse than I expected. I, I thought the contract would be awful. I, but I thought they were only overpaying by about a hundred million and they're overpaying by about <laughs> yeah, all of it. Yeah. We'll be recapping that series in our upcoming podcast episode Sunday night as the, again, the Rockies come into town to face the White Sox this weekend. Maybe just maybe the White Sox win a series <laughs> the first time since mid May. Yeah. I, I mean, it's it's one of the least watchable seasons. Uh, see, as long as, as we're as long as we're talking about South Park episodes, uh, there's an episode. There's an episode where they have a Margaritaville episode. Yeah, you know, I, I forget what the episode is it, but they keep putting money in the bank, and he says, "Okay, I'll put the money in the bank," <laughs> and it's gone. That's that's the Chris Bryant contract. Okay, this contract's going to be worth a hundred million dollars, <laughs> and it's gone. I I don't imitate uh, them very well, so you'll have to use your imagination. Rod- <laughs> imagination <laughs> imagination <laughs> imagination i love those episodes uh rodney wrote to us dan first thanks for adding to the meme collection of white Sox misery with your twitter posts this season if you can't laugh at this misery you'll go nuts uh, but Rodney asked a question, is there anything in the projections for the 2024 minor league performances for the White Sox that strike you as a positive or negative? Uh, well, I mean, you you look at the organization and there are, you know, there are some reasons in the system to to uh, really, you know, like the guys that are coming up. Uh, now, obviously, if. You, you you posed me the question about swapping the rosters completely, and that would still be pretty brutal. I actually did an article where I projected all the minor league teams as major league teams coming into the season, and uh, the Norfolk Tides, uh, the Orioles AAA franchise, still only came in at 56 wins. So every minor league team is going to look pretty awful, even one that does have some positives. Uh, when you look at the performances, uh if you're talking triple A, not really. It's just yeah, like because how does Zips look at Colson Montgomery yeah, right well, now? Because it's been an uneven season for him. Yeah, he's one of those players. Zips kind of came around on him quite a bit last year, and um, he's you know, not having a great season this year. Uh, the thing is, though, he he didn't really have a lot of time in double A. He probably should have started the season in double A. Uh, especially because what was his injury last year? I completely forgot. It was a back injury. A back injury. Uh, yeah, I think that necessarily that, that the White Sox probably should have done that. I'm still hopeful about him and the fact that he is for now at least sticking at shortstop. Uh, there's you should still like him even if you shouldn't be like he's as good as Jackson Holiday, who's still you know an incredible prospect despite having a bad week in his debut. Uh, but I I I like Montgomery and. I use him a lot hmm. in MLB the show too. So maybe I'm maybe I'm maybe I'm biased because sometimes I get a little biased in favor, I think, of, of players that I use a lot in MLB the show. Okay. I have to use that because James Vegan's also playing MLB the show. Uh he's like the road to the show, and he's currently on the White Sox and he's been sharing his uh experiences of dealing with the White Sox at arbitration. It is it has been hilarious in the VC group chat. Yeah, it, it it's it it's funny how it how it kind of shapes you because like all last year I kept feeling like John Birdie was better than he actually was <laughs> simply because he had a 99 stolen base 99 speed so I always had him as a as a pitch runner like anytime someone reached for his base uh, he's Duke Ellis uh, so I have two questions and thoughts left for you since we're at the midway point if you had to change your World Series prediction after watching the first half of the majors, who would your picks be to win the American League and the National League right now? Oh God, I'm trying to. I'm looking up my prediction because I'm because there's a tendency to remember your prediction sunnier when you don't look at them. Let's see. Right. I agree I with pick? that because uh, my uh, my preseason prediction was the Philadelphia Phillies over the Baltimore Orioles, and that's still looking pretty good. Mine was Atlanta Braves over the Baltimore Orioles. The Orioles are still looking good. Uh, the Braves as the uh, the World Series winner is not. Uh, the, I mean, that, that was helped, of course, by the injuries to Strider and Acuna, but Acuna wasn't having a great season, uh, and the Phillies have been terrific. The, the pitching staff has been phenomenal. It's been a chef's kiss. Uh, I actually 
wrote a piece because they uh, extended Christopher Sanchez mm -hmm. uh, a couple days ago through through his through his uh, uh, arbitration years. And when I projected out the rest of the season uh, from where they are, the Phillies rotation is one of the top rotations of the last 40 years. Uh, really the best wow. since 2013, at least for the projections. And the projections have them regressing quite a bit uh, with significantly uh, fewer uh, war in the second half than the first half. So the Phillies, I mean, I think be simply because that – your front four of your rotation is such a big deal when you talk playoff time uh, because you can, generally speaking, any frontline talent punches above its weight uh, in the you know, playoff situation because it's more greatness than depth, uh, which is more important over the course of a season. Uh, that The Phillies, I, I think, since they do have a clear shot to win the NL East, I think that the Braves are now severe underdogs. I, I think that the Phillies might be my World Series pick. I'm still going to say over the Orioles because I'm from Baltimore, and I'm tired <laughs> of you know predicting the Yankees to do things. <laughs> uh, like oh, the Yankees. Uh. I the I mean, Cleveland's playing great, but the Yankees and Orioles. I mean, those teams are loaded. They would scare me if. Yeah. Yeah, Cleveland. Cleveland. I mean, they play play better than mm -hmm. expected, but the rotation. You just look at it. You're like, okay, who are we facing in right. the playoffs? Every 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 pitching matchup and pitching matchups are pretty big probabilistically when you're looking at the outcome of individual games. Uh, the it's not great. I mean, who's their ace? I mean, Tanner Bybee against a healthy Garrett right. Cole or. Corbin Burns, I mean, I like Bybee, but that's not no. great. No, but um, one heck of a season, though, for Cleveland. Uh, being, yeah, absolutely. Being the front runners right now. Again, the best record in the American League at the halfway point. So my last question to you, which team, let's say currently, not holding a postseason spot, do you think will make the playoffs? Like my pick right now, and I think it, it's obvious because because they're hot and they've been in the American League Championship Series like six straight years, the Houston Astros. I think even though the Astros <laughs> have been so far back that they're going to find a way because I just don't have a lot of confidence in Boston or Kansas City being able to withstand Houston. And I just don't see the Houston Astros standing pat at the trade deadline they'll make another move and they'll find a way to sneak in as the sixth seed in the American league. So that's my team. That's currently not in the playoffs that I do think will make the playoffs at the end. Is there anyone that comes to your mind, Dan? Well, I was going to say Houston, and then you took him from me. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I'm going to get weird and say the Mets. All right. Okay. Okay. For, for two reasons. One, I think, with Pete Alonzo unsigned, I think that the team would be willing to make a big trade if they're close at the at the uh, at the deadline. I, I I think that's a possibility. And really, I mean, they're like a game out right now or so. And the thing is, Pete Alonzo leaving would feel bad from a Mets fan, which means something good has to happen before that, because that's the pattern of being a Mets fan. Something great happens. The better something happens, the larger the tragedy that results from that. So if you start with the uh, assumption that Pete Alonzo will not be will not be a Met next season and the Mets do little in free agency, uh, which is a possibility given where their organization is now and who's available this this winter, and say, okay, that's really bad. So something good has to happen to raise up Mets fans' hopes. Because that's what being Mets a Mets fan is about. And that would be it's, making the playoffs. Yeah, I'd be making a playoffs. And then horror. Uh, I, I I like to use the word horror a lot, uh, but I'm going to say Mets. Okay. I, I like that. So we got the Astros. We got the Mets. You guys can share your picks on the podcast page on SoxMachine.com. Let us know. I mean, that's a good question. Which team right now that would not be in the playoffs if the season ended, do you think will make the playoffs? And that will impact, of course, next month's trade deadline. You can follow Dan on Twitter. He's at DZaborski. You can read his excellent work on Fangraphs.com. And when the White Sox do start making moves and how it impacts as far as their future outlook, not just for the rest of 2024, but again, we have to zoom out White Sox fans and take a look at how it could impact 2025 
and 2026 and beyond. We'll have Dan back to break those trades down with us. Dan, as always, thanks for joining the Sox Machine podcast and uh, sharing some obscure but very popular South Park references. Always fun. Thanks for having me. Coming up after a word from our sponsors, Jonathan Nelson, the president and general manager of the Birmingham Barons, joins us to talk about the Barons' first half division win and the Rickwood Classic next on the Sox Machine podcast. This episode is presented by Game Time, an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to the first pitch. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, and views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying Major League Baseball tickets. The Colorado Rockies are in town to face the White Sox this weekend as the weather looks like it will cool off a little bit from the 90s it's been in Chicago, which will make it a fun time at the ballpark. There's going to be great tailgating for Saturday's game as our friends, the Chicago Sports Bums, will be hosting that tailgate in Lot B. So before the game, go find their flag and go hang out at their tailgate. Let them know that Josh Nelson from Sox Machine sent you their way because I'm heading to Fenway, which I'll use game time to help me get great seats for the upcoming San Diego Padres against the Boston Red Sox games. Maybe I'll get lucky and see old friend Dylan Cease. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use our promo code SOCKSMACHINE for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account on Game Time and use our promo code SOCKSMACHINE for $20 off. Game Time. Last minute tickets. Lowest price. Guaranteed. The Birmingham Barons finished the first half of 2024 with a 41-28 record, and they were able to hold back the Tennessee Smokies winning the Southern League North Division by half a game. That means for the first time since 2013, the Barons will be playing postseason games. While that's great news, Birmingham also hosted the Rickwood Classic last week. Not only did the Barons play another game at the country's oldest stadium, but Major League Baseball also had the San Francisco Giants and the St. Louis Cardinals in town for what was an emotional affair in the aftermath of the great Willie Mays passing. The reviews from the event nationwide have been terrific, and many hope around Major League Baseball that Rick Wood gets another chance to host a Major League game soon. So when it comes to baseball, Birmingham is glowing right now for good reasons. And joining us on the Sox Machine podcast to share what's happening is a good friend of the show. He's the president and general manager of the Birmingham Barons. It's Jonathan Nelson. And hey, Jonathan, welcome back to the show. Appreciate it, Josh. Thank you. It was great seeing Jim out at Rickwood last week as well. But yeah, it's always fun to join you. How about the Barons? Let's start with that. What is it? How does it feel back in the postseason? Yeah, I mean, clearly this has been an exciting team, and I, and, I, and and knowing that this is a beacon of hope for White Sox fans and and for for our Barons to be back in the postseason for the first time since 2013, and that was certainly a magical run back then. Um, it's just beyond satisfying and exciting. I know that you know while people don't really you know value, I think wins and losses from a, a distance in the minor leagues. I think that for us, people here in Birmingham certainly do. Uh, and to be able to to sort of stockpile the best you know prospects the White Sox have here at Regents Field, we're just very thankful. So it's so far you know obviously it's been a, a really good half. I mean obviously when you win it cures everything, uh, and and to be able to have the best prospects and, and to sort of continue to reload is is beyond exciting for us. Yeah, that 2013 team had Marcus Simeon who had a 903 OPS. Maybe the White Sox should have kept him. Uh, <laughs> nine side. <laughs> Trace Thompson, Tyler Saladino, Eric Johnson, who would eventually the next season win International League Pitcher of the Year, and then he was part of that Fernando Tatis Jr. trade, and Chris Bassett, current major leaguer. So there are multiple major leaguers. There's still major leaguers that were on the 2013 Baron squad, still playing in the majors. And we did get this question from one of our Patreon supporters, Jonathan, from As in Rec. And he was curious, like, how does your job different this year when the team is heading to the postseason in light of some struggles the f last few years of the Barons? Are you seeing better attendance? Are you getting more local media attention now? Yeah, I mean, you know, when, when it comes to the wins and losses and the, compared to recent years and specifically last year, when you're not losing – 
you know, six or seven to nothing in the seventh, a in second inning, um, you know, people stay for the game. Uh, and, and, and clearly too, um, you know, the media, you're more on, on the radar for the media. And, and there, there's reason for them to come out here and to do a variety of different stories, whether it be about our manager or, or our coaches and certainly our players as well that have, you know, connections. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's certainly an uptick. There's certainly a definitely more of an interest. Um, you know, whereas Birmingham traditionally, you know, typically, quote, unquote, a minor league town. In recent years, you've seen the, the, the USFL Birmingham. Him Stallions, they've, you know, since they started up, restarted, I guess, a few years ago, they've done well. And so people really like a winner. And, um, you know, they won the, the UFL championship this year again. And, and so for us to be back in the playoffs for the first time since 2013, and as you noted, that was a great team. That was a fun team. It was very satisfying. It was the first year we opened Regents Field. And and despite the fact we did lose Marcus Simeon in late July, we did get Micah Johnson who stepped in and, and really didn't lose a step um, and, and, and really and, and was the Southern League Championship MVP. But but that was a special team. And, and hopefully the way it looks right now is that, you know, despite the fact we've lost some players, um, four to the big leagues already this year, you know, it, it seems like, you know, we're going to continue to be in good position to maintain the bulk of this roster. And who knows with – the prospect of more trades occurring with the White Sox in the next month, um, you know, we could benefit from that as well. So uh, big picture is that we we fully expect our guys to be promoted and want them to be promoted to Charlotte and, and ultimately to the South side. But at the same time, we're, we're thankful to have the team we have right now. And Jonathan, to that point, like with the promotions, because new White Sox player to development, director of player development, Paul Janish, he told James Fegan, like, if they're ready in Birmingham, we have no fear calling them up, calling them up to Chicago, and we've already seen Drew Thorpe. We saw Duke Ellis, Brian Ramos earlier this season. And how does that change, like the way that you help these guys prepare? Because usually, when we talk about promotions for Birmingham, it's all right; they're on the clock. When are they going to get to Charlotte? Well, now if the organization changes their mind and if they see like a Drew Thorpe and be like, you know what, he's ready. We're not even going to bother with AAA. We're just going to call him straight up to the majors. Like how does that change for you guys and getting them prepared for those promotions? Well, when they show up from spring training each year, you know, I talk to the team and, and tell them, you know, try to paint a picture about our history, about the ballpark, about the city, and and certainly want to make sure that they have a great time and their family and friends have a great time when they come to Birmingham. Uh, at the same time, I also tell them in the same breath that, you know, we want, you know, this Birmingham is not going to be their final destination and we want them to continue to progress. But we want them, like many others over the years, whether it be Chris Getz or Bobby Jinks or, or so many players over the years that have had success at big league level, um, that we want Birmingham to be their favorite, you know, stop along the way in, in their progress to getting to the major leagues. And, um, you know, we re we realize that, you know, we're going to always going to be a, a victim of our success and, and we want the players to pr be promoted. But at the same time, you hope that what happened like in 2013 with Marcus Simeon occurred. Um, we thought it was a devastating blow. He was the Southern League MVP that year. Uh, and clearly he's gone on to have a great major league career. Yet at the same time, you had a Micah Johnson tearing it up in Winston-Salem that year. And when he came in, there was really no, no real, you know, issue at all when it came to resuming the, the high cal uh, caliber play at that position. So, you know, hopefully that, that those things occur. Uh, I think that right now the the way this, this team looks is that, you know, a lot of these guys, whether it be Brooks Baldwin or, or now, you know, Jacob Gonzalez or you know, Tim Elko, you know, overall and and so many others, Edward Caro, all that. You know, th we certainly anticipate promotions, but at the same time, I mean, there's a draft looming coming up soon. Uh, and as mentioned, you know, there's going to be some trades along the way as well. But at the, at the same time, there's there's some good talent behind us as well. So we, we just hope that once players are promoted, that there's not going to be too much of a gap between, you know, the quality of play. Yeah, you lost Drew Thorpe, but you gained Noah Schultz. That's a good example of some of the promotions yeah. that could help the Barrett's in the second half. In Chicago, we're all rooting for you guys. Uh, as we need something positive. So the Barons should go out and win the second half. So we're ready to watch some postseason baseball in September from afar. But last week was the Rickwood Classic. And as you mentioned, you got a chance to run to Jim. And Jim was able to go down there for the Barons portion. For our listeners who may not be familiar, Jonathan, the Barons have played games in the past at Rickwood Field. So how was this year's game different from past events? You know, we first started turning out the clock at Rickwood Field in 1996, uh, and the, the last season that we called Rickwood home was 1987. 
Um, if you're a baseball history fan, which I know a lot of White Sox fans are, and, and appreciate all the just the reverence of statistics and great teams and all that, and the design of a, a vintage ballpark, then you'd love Rickwood Field. Uh, opened in 1910, designed after the same architect who did Forbes Field in Pittsburgh, and it just reeks with so much history. Um, and so it, it's always a labor of love for me, despite the fact of being able to, to work at the Hoover Met all those years, and certainly here at Regents Field. But, but you know, turning back the clock a lot, we, we've always known we've had something special. Um, and each year when we host the Rickwood Classic, we've always celebrated a different team, a different era, different affiliates along the way. Um, and again, you know, it's something that over the years, it really built up a reputation in, 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 across the country. I mean, it was not uncommon to, to meet people that would fly into Birmingham just for the day from Texas, from the Carolinas, from Minnesota, from, from all across the country. And um, so, but to be able to honor and celebrate and recognize the Negro Leagues, the Black Barons and, and the Negro Leagues in, in, as a whole and their accomplishments and their contributions to, to the game of baseball and to America on a national stage was just unbelievable. To me, it reminded me, you know, I went up to the uh, All-Star game at, at um, U.S. Cellular or Comiskey Park, whatever it was in 2003. And it sort of reminded me when I take a step back of that week, because once every, once our homestand ended on, on Sunday, Father's Day, it really, it really became a huge event all week. And wherever you could throw a stone in Birmingham last week and you would hit an event that was something, you know, related to, to the major league events going on, whether it be an unveiling of a, a Willie Mays mural downtown or a variety of events that, that were being hosted, you know, in our backyard uh, at the Negro Southern League Museum or wherever. Um, just really a fun week. And, and for Birmingham to be the spotlight and, and certainly the center of the baseball universe for one week um, and to be able to recognize the contributions of Willie Mays and the Black Barons and, and all the great uh, legendary Negro leaguers was just unbelievable. But it reminded me of that All-Star uh, week because it was always something. Um, but, you know, it, unlike, you know, in the past where obviously this was something special for the Magic City, for, for what we have here in Birmingham, to share it with, with the world was super cool. What was it like to see major leaguers at Rickwood? You know, it, it was it was fun. At that point, I'll be honest with you, there had been so much. We we were so involved for months, weeks leading up to it. And like hosting an all-star game like we did in 09 and, and 18, um, the last few weeks, especially when you lead into it with a six-game homestand, was very intense for me. Uh, so by the time we got to the uh, major league game on Thursday, I was sort of – as I say, the last day of a homestand landing the plane. So at that point for me on a personal level, you know, the finish line was close. And so I did everything I could to enjoy it, but just to be there and this, the stars aligned for Birmingham because all the events went went perfectly. The weather was perfect. Um, I know Major League Baseball could not have been more impressed. The guests that we had here in town all week just loved Birmingham, uh, whether it be the, the the restaurants that, you know, I, I, I sort of became a concierge for so many different major leaguers. It's that, you know, a couple months ago, they, they said, hey, look, Commissioner Manford loves steakhouses please recommend. So I had to ask my wife, you know, what are the best steakhouses here in town? So it, it, it became sort of a, you know, sort of a, a, a reference for so many different things. But in the end, it was it was one where I think that it was just so special for everybody that uh, and, and I and I have not to be honest with you, it was because I was so focused and so just sort of embedded in everything. I have not been able to take a step back and 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 really digest any of the media, you know, whether it be you know online or or, or radio or even the DV. I DVR the games, but I haven't seen it yet because it was just it's so raw for me right now. And of course, we began a, a nine game homestand last night, so it's one of those things. In due time, I'll be able to enjoy it probably as I get a little bit more separation from it. Yeah, like in October, like when the season ends, like, all right, you know, I can go back to enjoy. All the and our game was did. incredible um, on Tuesday. It was. It, 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 it was, you know, and, you know, having, you know, been to all the events last week, um, you know, and I'm, I'm, I realize I'm biased, but I balanced this off a few of our, our staff that attended them as well. But it seemed like our game, you know, with the unique timing of the announcement of Willie Mays passing, uh, us being the Birmingham Black Barons and the way we sort of stormed back and really made it a game up until the final outs, um, 
was was very magical. And I wish we could have gotten over the top, but at the same time, it's just the way it was. But it was it was still a fun night at the ballpark. And that was the first time that we'd played under the lights. The Rickwood Classic historically is always a day game, a 12-30 game, because the, the lights don't work there. So they put portable lights at Rickwood Field last week for all the events. So moving forward, when we when we host the Rickwood Classic, it'll be a, a day game once again. Yet to be able to play that game under the lights made it a little bit more significant, more magical. The vibe was incredible. Yeah, I was going to ask about the lighting situation because I don't recall that the lights worked anymore at Rickwood Classic or you, you wanted to turn the lights on, uh, the, the the old light structure. But like moving forward, like so Major League Baseball, are, do you know what their plans are? Do they want to come back? Are they trying to help improve Rickwood Field? Because Field of Dreams game happened. The White Sox obviously involved. Now Frank Thomas is part owner of Field of Dreams. They're blowing that entire area up where they're going to have multiple diamonds and national showcases for Little League and prep games going to be happening in the middle of Iowa. Any future plans for Rickwood Field? You know, I don't have any insider information other than I know that, you know, the intent was this was, you know, the focus was going to be this was going to be a one-time event. Yet at the same time, knowing Major League Baseball's value their commitment to to honoring and celebrating the negro leagues in a variety of different ways I, I i'm hopeful that they return and i know that you know we we did everything within our power to make sure that their their games their events all their activities here in town uh, were smooth and we did everything we could to, to sell them on the fact that you know making this if it's not an annual event, you know, every few years would be incredible and and i think that now the, the onus quite frankly is on you know us here in Birmingham to make sure that the Rickwood Field maintains the quality. Um, there are so many corporate partners that that you know invested in in, in the ballpark. There were so many upgrades, uh, whether it be the playing field, the dugouts, the extending extension of nets, a variety of other things at the ballpark that that made it safe for players made it, you know, safe for fans. Uh, and now, you know, the ball sort of in our court to make sure that the field maintains itself and that we first and foremost have the ability to, to turn back the clock every year and do our Rickwood classic game. But hopefully every few years, major league baseball will be able to return here and, and continue to celebrate and honor the Negro leagues. Now that would be awesome. That would be cool because it was a it was definitely an awesome experience to be able to watch it live for the major league game and of course Edgar Caro having the night he had uh, earlier for the minor league classic and we are excited to hear that it will continue at least to turn back the clock for the Barons portion moving forward for that stadium. You can follow Jonathan on Twitter. He's at Jonathan N underscore Beham. And of course, follow the Birmingham Barons on all social media platforms to get the latest highlights, news, and photos of how the AA affiliate for the White Sox are doing. You can also go to the Barons store at barons.milbstore.com where they do have some gear from the Rickwood Classic. And if you are watching this on YouTube or any of our highlights, you can see that my Barons hat has seen a lot of sun. So if you're like me and you need new Barons gear, you can go to their team store and purchase that. Jonathan, as always, great to catch up. Good luck in the second half, but we're excited for you guys that we'll be able to cover some postseason minor league games for a White Sox affiliate this year. And uh, again, we're all rooting for you guys up here in Chicago. Thanks, Josh. And, and look forward to more, hopefully providing more, more hopeful, you know, news and everything. And uh, look forward to hopefully talking more uh, once, you know, we get past the first round and then continue and progress and, and bring home a championship and even more so showcase the best prospects the White Sox had to offer. That will do it for this episode of the Sox Machine Podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you just discovered the Sox Machine Podcast, you can subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts, such as Spotify and Apple Music. You could also listen to the show on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Sox Machine. Follow Sox Machine on social media on any platform at Sox Machine. You could follow James Fegan at J.R. Fegan. He will continue covering the White Sox home games this weekend against the Rockies, so he'll, he'll have the latest intel from the White Sox clubhouse. And you could follow me on social media at Sox Machine underscore Josh. If you enjoy our work and want full access of our coverage of the Chicago White Sox, you can sign up at patreon.com slash Sox Machine. Monthly plans start at $5, and again, it unlocks all of our coverage of the White Sox. You get an ad-free version of the podcast, an ad-free version of the website. We also have additional tiers of support. 
We have a couple spots open still in our Veterans Committee, in which our VCs get all of the benefits, plus being part of a group chat with James and Jim, so they have direct access, they receive even, and they receive even more intel of what is happening from the clubhouse in that group chat. So if that's something that you are interested in or you want more from us, go to patreon.com slash machine and sign up today. The Sox Machine Podcast is a production of SoxMachine.com. You're on for all the things Chicago White Sox baseball and part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Josh Nelson. Thanks for listening and watching. For the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase, it's a culture. And the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety-minded who watch everyone's backs, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done.